अलधेशु तो पच अधुनालधेशु Hello everyone. Welcome. My name is Jisha Menon and I'm a faculty director at the Center for South Asia and the Denning Faculty Director of Stanford Arts Institute and I'm a professor in the Department of Theater and Performance Studies at Stanford. Thank you all for joining us today. Um let me sta start with a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that Stanford sits on the ancestral and unceded land of the Mowak Mowakma Ohlone tribe. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. Consistent with the values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to honor and make visible the university's relationship to indigenous peoples. So thank you all for joining us today um evening here in California and um uh, morning for those of you who are joining us from India. Um this is part of our series Arts and Justice. It's a webinar series that's sponsored by a Kohler grant from Stanford Global Studies and it builds on the success of the Arts and Justice initiative of the Stanford Arts Institute which I also direct. The Center for South Asia series is co-sponsored by the Institute for Asia uh, South Asian Studies at Berkeley and Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Stanford. I'd like to thank my Center for South Asia team for making this happen, Lalita Duperon and Simrat Kaur Matharu for all the hard work behind the scenes. They've been really doing some incredible work. So thank you so much. This series uh we started it in the hope that uh it that you know uh, we could explore the ways in which arts can expose us to inequities and injustice in our society arts are widely praised for their ability to awaken our sense of beauty of fellow feeling and of empathy towards those who are not like us to those who are on the margins of society and in so doing arts can inspire a sense of ethical responsibility to others whom we otherwise may only be aware of in a uh in a maybe in a peripheral way so music in particular we think can offer an acoustic environment in which one can immerse oneself and lose a sense of boundedness music is not something that exists out there outside of us but it courses through our body turning our body into a a channel a kind of resounding channel as its rhythm meets the rhythm of our breath and its beat meets the sound of our pulse music does not respect borders or boundaries it in fact it abolishes distance uh, it summons our ability to be attuned to one another and to resonate with the feelings and suffering of another it, it has the capacity to open up the listener in recent months we've seen an efflorescence of artistic activity in india poetry and music seem to flourish as voices of dissent are increasingly muffled ordinary citizens have turned to forms of cultural expression uh, to critique and protest authoritarianism um, and forms of state repression but let's be clear eyed about the power and the peril of the arts while arts can absolutely offer an antidote to the suffering of society they can also perpetuate existing relations of power more than any other artist tm krishna has urged us to examine the inequities within the arts itself the ways in which arts can be a source of unexamined privilege of elitism and can perpetuate caste and gender hierarchy so let me uh now introduce our distinguished speaker and uh our fellow panelists Uh Mr TM Krishna is a vocalist in the Karnatak tradition his musicality eludes standard analyses as a public intellectual he speaks and writes about issues affecting the human condition and about cultural matters he has started and is involved in many organizations whose work is spread across the whole spectrum of music and culture He has co-authored Voices Within Carnatic Music Passing on an Inheritance a book dedicated to the greats of Carnatic music his book A Southern Music the Carnatic Story published by Harper Collins in 2013 was a first of its kind philosophical aesthetic and socio-political exploration of Carnatic music 
For this, he was awarded the 2014 Tata Literature Award for Best First Book in Nonfiction category. His book, Reshaping Art, published in 2018, asks important questions about how art is made, performed, and disseminated, and addresses crucial questions of caste, class, and gender within society while exploring the contours of democracy, culture, and learning. His latest award-winning book, Sebastian and Sons, traces the history of the Mridangam maker and the Mridangam over the past century. In 2016, T.M. Krishna received the prestigious Ramon Magsaysay Award in recognition of his forceful commitment as artist and advocate to art's power to heal India's deep social divisions. In 2017, he received the Indira Gandhi Award for national integration for his services in promoting and preserving national integration in the country. We're so honored to have you join us today at Stanford. Welcome. Thank you. I'm also delighted to invite, uh, to uh, introduce our two panelists. Uh, professor Anna Schultz is a associate professor of music at the University of Chicago and a former colleague, a beloved colleague of mine uh, from Stanford. The core issue animating her research in India and beyond is music's power to activate profound religious experiences that in turn shape other identities. Her first monograph, Singing a Hindu Nation, charts the nationalist interventions of Western Indian devotional performers from the late 19th century uh, to the 21st century. Her cent uh, second book project, Songs of Translation, Bene Israel Performance from India to Israel, explores gender and cultural translation in the devotional songs of the Bene Israel, a Marathi speaking Jewish people from Western India. Aishwari Kumar is a visiting fellow here at the Center for South Asia at Stanford. His work spans issues in moral and political philosophy, constitutional theory and political justice, empire and liberalism, and the history of democratic thought and rights. He's the author of Radical Equality, Ambedkar, Gandhi, and the Risk of Democracy, and is currently working on a new project titled The Sovereign Void, Ambedkar's Critique of Violence, which examines the genealogies of political freedom and war in Southern and Atlantic political thought and their relations to notions of force across epistemological, theological, and secular traditions. Welcome to all of you. To begin this program, uh, we'll start off with some brief comments from TM Krishna, and then uh, we'll bring in our panelists, Anna and Aishwari, to engage in a conversation with him. So I'll turn things over now to uh, TM Krishna. Thank you very much, uh, Jusha. I'd like to thank uh, Lalita, Simrat, and uh, Anna and Aishwari for being here and thank you for inviting me uh, to be part of this conversation. <clears throat> I'm not going to take too much of your time. I'm just going to um, start off where Jisha left or the descriptions that were quite exquisite about what music can do, uh, what it's capable of and the feelings it evokes. And I'd like to say that that's where the problem begins. Um, the problem begins in that otherworldly possibility that uh, art and music Music especially, and I'll, I'll come to why, uh, does to all of us. Um, the thing about music is it is intangible physically. Um, you may have an instrument, you may have uh, something physical that is a resonating chamber, but the sound itself is almost magical, which is why all traditions across the world, uh, whether it's chanting, whether it is that sound, or whether it is a, a tone or, or, or a musical tune, have always been part of evoking something that human beings believed connects them to, to realms that the tactile and temporal cannot do, which is why chanting is also such an important part, or gospel is, every one of them is. And that is fundamentally why challenging any of the structures that actually embolden uh, oppressive behavior, oppressive practices within the world of music become that much harder because the experience of it always seems to tell us, no, this is so beautiful. Uh, this is something incredible. It, like she said, connects people across uh, faiths and religions. I really don't buy that, to be very honest, but nevertheless, I will let that pass for now. But uh, the feeling is real. The feeling is real. The experience is true, and I don't think any of, any of us can challenge it. But the problem begins there. I'm not sure I can say I've really... 
um, done so much uh, that's that's as to say that I've used music to ask difficult questions. But let me let me just try and give you an example of a few things that I've been part of. Um, I very strongly believe that any of the questioning has to begin right from the interior of the practice that you are involved in, the environment that you are participating in. And therefore, um, the first challenges that I think I was participating in, I was asking questions about, was the very idea of performance of Carnatic music, which I sing. What is it we are sharing? Is that an equitable stage? Are we sharing as members on stage, as people who are friends, who are enjoying this art form and who want to share in that experience? Or are we governing and directing and controlling people on stage? What are the elements that go into this kind of power game? We have to realize a performance is actually a power game. I know it really sounds unfair and maybe even incorrect, but it is a power game. Who controls whom? When can I be free? to sing that beautiful line. It sounds bizarre, but actually there are people, we are thinking that. A violinist on the stage is hoping for that moment where she or he is not transgressing on me and can be free. So it is my look, it is my permission that allows for freedom of musical expression and finally re re reaching the audience for few, um, musical experience. So, this entire performance of the art form is a problematic space. So for my questioning started right there. How do we sit on stage? Why am I sitting at the center of the stage? Why is there a difference between the way the audience will perceive TM Krishna, uh, a, a powerful male, than compared to a woman? What do they expect from me? What do they expect from a woman musician? Is it different? It is different. Why is it different? Why am I automatically endowed with the possibility of singing what you could call serious music, heavy music, music that has intellect, but a woman has to always prove herself. All this is in play in that beautiful experience, that otherworldly possibility. And then there is caste. Who, what are the parameters based on which we even assess quality or assess ability? Looking at a person, every Indian is already measuring caste, class, genders, everything. So is the, is the possibility of sharing the stage or the possibility of sharing the, sharing the space of being an audience also being governed by these questions? I think this is where my journey really began, is completely within the practice. I had not seen anything beyond this. Let me be very honest. And... Um, um, since Jisha spoke about Sebastian and Sons, even my mind there was only limited to the performance, to the performative, to the performer, to the audience. I never thought about the instrument maker for a long time. Where is the instrument maker? Is he or she part of this culture? Are they participating in the divinity that we proclaim in the art form? How do we challenge the chasm between purity and impurity, between the person who skins the buffalo and the cow and the goat, um, cu um, cures the skin, make sure that you don't have to call it skin anymore. You can call it mridangam. You can call it tabla. You can, you can keep it in the puja room. You can worship it. Who is that person? Where is that person placed in that divine experience? Is that person even existent in the divinity that you experience? I mean, these are the challenging questions, and I'm not saying that we have answers for it, but this complicates the notion of that experience. It should complicate the notion of experience. It should complicate our, our belief system in that experience. It, it still doesn't destroy it. It just makes it, I think, far more real. And so uh, it was an engaging, changing many of these things in my practice, in the way I sing, in the way we share, in reducing the power that is that is um, that I possess because of my caste, because of my gender, because of my class, that I could place myself in a vulnerable position to experience art in a far freer manner. I could be free to some extent, at least momentarily, from the power that limits me from freedom. So we should remember that 
freedom is limited not just by not having power, but freedom is also limited because of power itself. And that is something the powerful rarely recognize. So all the little changes that I brought in began with this. And I'd like to then just expand the scope a little bit more um, and talk about two interesting projects that traverse uh, social justice and environmental justice. One was called the Porumbok Kapadal. Some of you may have heard of it. It was the Porumbok song. And um, this song happened, uh, I don't remember which year now, at least at least four years ago. And I'll give you the context for it. I live in the city of Chennai in, in India. And like in every city, you have spaces that are considered no-go zones, spaces that are considered violent, high crime rate, where the most marginalized live, where the civic facilities are the least, nobody cares. And in India, these are the places where most Dalit communities live, fisher folk live, the tribals live, and we also make sure that the most toxic factories are in this area, and the labor for this factory are from these communities. We make sure um, the power stations are there, the thermal power stations are there. In Chennai, this area is in north of Chennai. In fact, in Chennai, if you say not Chennai or in Tamil, Vada Chennai, it's almost uh, a synonym for a place of danger. And that's how stigmatized that place is. This song was addressing this fundamental environmental disaster zone that North Chennai has become because of the number of power plants, number of ply ash ponds, a uh, thousand, thousand acres of mangroves destroyed, a river almost dead, fisher folk needing to go deep into the sea for, um, for fish, and an entire cultural economy being in tatters. Something that has been fought for many years. So the Poromboku Padal challenged this very physical happening. At the same time, one of the other things that really uh, triggered me about this project is the word Poromboku. The word Poromboku actually is used in the sense of meaning useless, good for nothing. So you would be generally abused in the city of Chennai as a Poromboku uh, if somebody thought you're good for nothing. But that word is actually quite beautiful. In English, it's simply the commons, that which is not owned by private individuals or private entities, that which belongs to the people, like the parks, like the forests, like the rivers, like the lakes, like the mountains, and like the public road, or like all that, that we all share. And that's the Porumbok. But that's become, that has become an abused word, fundamentally because during the British time, they couldn't get taxes out of it. It was non-taxable land or lake. Therefore, it was of no use. Therefore, it was good for nothing. But it implies also that the people who inhabit those spaces, use those spaces, live by the spaces, have built cultures and rituals and ways of living from those spaces also become useless. And they are always the marginalized. So this song challenged the larger philosophical idea and the specific event. In the world of Carnatic music or the classical arts in general, we never use the Franca lingua of the common person. That's a very tactical move to remain elevated. It is not accidental, and I will never accept an argument that it just happens by accident. It's tactical by the holding community, which is the community of privilege, not to relate itself to that which happens on the soil, in the soil, in front of us on the streets. And therefore, we never use the Franca lingua of the local people or, or the everyday people, if I correct myself. And this was the first time there was a possibility to sing in what we call Chennai Tamil, the Tamil that is spoken in the streets of Chennai, in ragas and thalas. Um, so that excited me, and we came up with this song, Poramboka Padal. And um, so that was an intervention which was environmental. It was an intervention that was ethical and political and, and uh, social justice. It was also an aesthetic in intervention, which questioned the notion of sound, what sound is permitted in what zone? Why is it not permitted? Why am I comfortable with certain words said in a certain manner? I'm not comfortable with the same words said in a different manner. Why cannot the classical or the so-called classical be the common? And I think that was a fascinating project. Connected to that was another project again, 
it was called Kodakanal Want. I wouldn't say it was a within quotes Carnatic song, whatever that is supposed to mean. Um, or let me say it was not raga based music. That's possibly in a looser and a more accurate term. But Kodakanal Want was challenging Unilever's exploitation of the people of Kodakanal, where their factory had actually leaked mercury into the soil and into the lives of their work of the workers of the factory. Um, I, and it is it, these two songs are also interesting experiences because Purumboko Padal got a lot of attention and a lot of talk and a lot of people realized what was happening and it, 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 has, it has become a part of a conversation on music's role in environmental and social justice. Kodikanal want failed, if you can call that. So it's an interesting question of what fails and what is, a, what is failure when you venture into these spaces. When is it a success? Is it a success always or, or is there always pending justice? So how does uh, art and music continue an engagement in such a scenario? Within the world of Carnatic music itself, I have been, tried to include conversations in content beyond the structural questions I raised in the beginning. Uh, also in content, what do I sing about? What don't I sing about? What are the ideas that I don't want to be taken as serious? I'm willing to keep it at the periphery end of a concert when people are ready to go home, but they can't be the main part. So how can we change that? And that's when the partnership with this incredible Indian author who you may have heard of, Permal Murugan, is one of the greatest writers we have in this country today, a Tamil writer. And we started creating musical content that started speaking about complex issues. And in that, I would like to talk about one song that took one and a half years to actually write. It was a song on manual scavenging, something that's abolished in India, but happens every day. Uh, we're all participants in its uh, recurrence and its uh, sustained happening around us. And the song addressed the ugliness of manual scavenging. And I'm talking about this because there's an interesting word in it. The first line of that song is Nara Malam Allalama. The translation is, well, the translation, this line is, um, can we be allowed to pick up stinking feces? That's what it is. And I remember Murugan wrote the song. That's the first line of a, of a classical music song. I mean, it's, it's not something that you would ever hear. But there was another twist to this. And I remember Murugan wrote the song. I had tuned it, I'd set it. I was going to sing it for the first time on stage and he happened to be there that day. And he just turned around to me and he said, you know, uh, malam is a kind of a Sanskritized word the actual word for feces or for shit in Tamil is P. Now P is colloquial and P sounds worse to a Tamilian than Malam. And he says, are you okay singing P? And I thought that question itself was very interesting that he presumed that there would be discomfort. Uh, and I, there was discomfort somewhere inside me to utter that word, to say shit, literally say shit. Um, and sing about the ugliness of that on stage. So these are, I think, important moments when an art form also starts changing its internal character and what it sings, what it doesn't sing. There is also um, other, uh, multiple other voices that we, I've tried bringing in. One is incredible Malayalam thinker, philosopher, and social worker, Narayana Guru. The question of, can we sing Christian hymns, Christian lyrics? on Jesus, on Allah, which have all been attempts to challenge what we are facing in this country, which is um, uh, really, really right-wing Hindutva uh, bullying, which believe that uh, we should, I mean, Carnatic music is Hindu music and you cannot be singing on, on, uh, with Christian lyrics and it's going to be used for, to part of a conversion a strategy. I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of that, but again, can we, can we have a concert which says Rama, Krishna, Allah, Jesus, and also says, no, I don't believe in God. Can all that coexist exist in the narration of a musical form? I think that itself is something to look at. Then there is also the very, very physical ideas of access and access at both ends. Access as a listener, access as wanting to be a performer, or participating in the performance of the music. That's also an area where I've tried doing some, some work. So breaking the spaces, where can the classical perform? Where can it not perform? Can it be on the streets? Can it be at the seashore? Can it be on a, on a public transport bus? Um, can it rub shoulders with 
art forms that are part of a completely different cultural environment, which are considered outside. What is, I mean, or take a school, what is taught in a classroom and what is taught outside a classroom? That's a very interesting uh, way uh, to look at it because you'll find the classical is always formalized. The so-called non-classical is not formalized in the way it is shared, it's talked about, it's researched. Um, so these are also places where I've tried working with younger people, with musicians, um, with uh, audiences. So challenging space content people, I think, are all part of this process. And very importantly, creating spaces for multiple other cultural art forms um, to be performed, um, to allow conversations between people who want to have conversations. And I want to say something important here. Sometimes I have realized that even people like me uh, who proclaim ourselves to be progressive uh, also prejudge the conservative. And that's also a learning for me uh, because sometimes it's just that a bridge has not been built. The possibility of a conversation has never happened. You could ask, why didn't the privilege make that possibility? But that's, uh, to me, a moot question. Let's make that possibility real. Let's, let's create that temporary bridge. And let's hope for that conversation. And there could be that one person who's going to go back learning something. And I've learned that uh, because I have, I have judged people. I presumed them um, because, of my, uh, because of the high ground that I presume I occupy. And I think that that's also something that I've learned to discard. Uh, part of this has also been collaborations. And one collaboration I'll mention and I'll stop is with Katai Kut, uh, also sometimes referred to as Ter Kut, and there is, there is a nuance there, but I'm not going into that, uh, which is an art form which occupies a completely different social spectrum. And I'm speaking about this collaboration specifically because of what I learned from it. You know, one is, and I want to finish with this, because one is to intellectually believe in the sense, believe in equality of culture, equality of being, and I'm saying equality of culture specifically, uh, because that is something we don't think of. Equality of culture, equality of being, equality of creative spirit, equality of beauty. Again, a complicated idea. But to feel that is an entirely different thing. I think for a long time, I understood it and believed that's what I should be, but I did not feel it. And I do believe a lot of us also occupy, are in that space for one culture or the other. You may feel the connectivity in one, with something else we don't. And so there's always a judgment or a placing on different hierarchies and pedestals that happens instinctively within our sensibilities. And Katai Kutu was something that I, I saw, I had no connection to. I just didn't know how to get into that world. And I thought it was raw, it was rural, and all these words are problematic. It was not sophisticated enough. And that's when this interaction with this great artist, Raju Gopal, uh, the Katekuta Sangam began. And uh, we started collaborating and exploring the possibility of what we later christened the Karnatic Kut. Um, and in the process of that coming together, I went and saw so many Kutu performances. And the debaggaging of all the privileges that, aesthetic privileges that I, I, I possess, They've not gone as yet, I can assure you, they're still there, I'm still fighting them. But the debaggaging happened through a period of immersion. And after some time, I realized that I was experiencing beauty and sound in a way that I never have. Now, even a simple question of what is in tune does not have an absolute answer. What is in tune to a Carnatic year is not in tune to a Hindustani year. What is in tune to a Hindustani year is not in tune for a Western classical year. What is in tune for a Western classical year is not in tune for some other culture. So even the idea of singing in pitch is culturally, socially almost defined. So how do we loosen that? How do we loosen that whole notion? So you hear the senses of beauty. You hear different angles of being in pitch. So Katekutu 
was for me off pitch. Everything about it was off tune, not just the music, but everything. And then it almost magically came together. I can't explain this. I can't tell you what I did or what I didn't do. I can just tell you one day that it was just profound. It was as profound as anything I've experienced in the music that I sing or in the music that I, I associate with. And that movement for us personally, I think is a very important part of the political, the public, the philosoph philosophical, and the social discourse. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, TM, for that, that wonderful overview of some of your work. Um, and, and thank you for joining us across time and space. Um, so I'll perhaps pick up on this issue of, um, of kind of hearing and those sort of barriers that you encountered in some of these projects um, and connect it to, to listening, to music making as, um, as a sort of practice and, and also an artifact of listening. Um, so, and I'm thinking in particular of a lovely introduction you gave to a performance with Jogapa singers, um, a different project. Um, and you said, you asked the question, through sound, can we listen to each other? And I just really um, love that. Um, and you talked about how difficult it is to listen to one another because we're primed to listen through what we already know. So this sort of connects with what you were just saying, but I hear in your music this um, acute attention to listening and relationality. So in the way that you, um, you deeply listen to Jogapa singers as you sang along with them, or um, the way that you generously and openly listen to, to violin accompanists, um, of course, you know, um, being a Carnatic violinist, it seems to require this really intense, deep listening and careful attention um, it, it to, you know, in order to copy the, and, and respond to the, to the vocalist. But I feel like you bring that also, that's that kind of careful, deep listening to violinists and you welcome sort of new inspiration from the violinists also. And I think you, you've written about that also in your book. Um, a Southern music. Um, so I wondered if you could say a bit about how you think about the connection between musical listening and, and social justice, or perhaps music listening, listening and social justice. Cause we, you know, in this day and age, we, in this moment, I should say, we just talk past one another so often. You know, I, thank you for asking that question, Anna, because I mean, the first question that strikes me when you ask that is, uh, do musicians actually listen? I mean, do we really listen? Is itself, itself something that needs exploration? Um, I listen to the nuts and bolts. I listen to the technicalities. I listen to identities. But I'm, am I actually listening? You know, uh, It's not very different from what we do in a conversation. I, I've heard every word that you've said, but am I listening to you? You know, I can give you synonyms for everything you said, but am I listening to you? Right, because the, that's, I think that's the idea of sound. We forget that, you know, the most beautiful part of listening is not just the semantic um, comprehension, but is also the sound in the comprehension. Uh, we all know a, a one word can be said in so many different ways and can mean so many different things. What is that? Which dictionary gives us that? No dictionary can give you that. It is only listening that can give you that. And so in my own practice, I, I will come to the conversation, but in my own practice, have I heard that? And I don't think I heard it for most of the time. And I don't think most of us do. I know a generalization is others, but I'm still going to make it. And so I don't think we do. I really don't think musicians actually listen. Um, uh, we, we are always in performance mode. We are performing, you know? And so we have no time to listen. And to perform, we have governed. I mean, this is very, very, very it's identical to how our social structure is, isn't it? We are all performing, and there's someone with greater power to curate the performance, or some people or the groups, and everybody is then aligned to that 
uh, that performance mode and we're all performing. And that's what music becomes ultimately. So I think it took a long time for me to first start listening to myself. I think it started there. Uh, when I actually heard the sound in the music I was singing. I know, for example, the sound, I, the sound I hear when I sing a line of music now is entirely different from the sound I heard 20 years ago. If you ask me what it is, I do not know. I don't have an answer that's going to define it. But I just know I'm able to listen in a manner that I didn't listen then. Okay? And I think that that's essentially what I'm speaking about when I'm saying, can we hear, listen through sound? I didn't say listen through raga. I didn't say listen through song. I didn't say any of that, but sound. So can we allow that? So when we do that, somehow we, some of our judgment modes, some of our, our what we already know, the known, at least, shall we say, gets get subdued for a period of time. And when it is subdued, we become open to receiving in a manner that we normally are not. And that's the, that is a channel that I think <clears throat> we're all hoping to open when we write a book, when we, when we write a poem, when we sing a song, or when we dance. We're trying to open that channel, that possibility of, an, of that engagement and that receivability. And I think that's, that's exactly what happened when I, we spent time with the Jogapas. You know, the first time I heard them, I could very simply say that with, with all the privilege and arrogance that I possessed that they were not, they, they were not, that's not music, that's very raw stuff. But it is music of such profundity that I am incapable of accessing. So listening allows you to open that capability of listening, of, of, of accessing a culture, accessing a being, accessing the struggle, accessing all that through that sound. You know, in those moments when we cry, when we don't know why we are crying, it are the moments we are actually listening. But we are so scared of that listening that we run back away from it. Because we don't want to be vulnerable. And when we listen, we are vulnerable because a lot of things we believe may be shattered. Yeah. Did you find... How, how did you open up that space? How did you get, get to that place? I mean, just seeing you on stage, I felt like there was a shift where it, in which you sort of allowed yourself to, to sort of be not an audience member, but a, a sort of listening participant um, to Jogapa singers who were leading, leading the singer. Um, was it something about that sort of um, positioning yourself differently on the stage and imagining your role it, differently. That, I'm, 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 it's interesting you brought that up. I'll tell you what happened after the couple of performances. Very interesting. So if you look at the videos which are online, you will see me at the center and the Jogapas around me. And I was talking, speaking to this young academic. Um, he was interviewing me. And uh, this is a few, maybe even a year after the first few performances. And he, he very, very casually asked me, Mr. Krishna, can you tell me why you always sit in the center? It had not even struck me. Uh, it had not even struck me. And uh, of course, I can, I can give you logical answers and why I should be seated there. So the next performance, we changed it. Uh, of course, also realize, again, you know, that's, that's another nuance. I changed it. Now, that itself is problematic, isn't it? Fundamentally. That even enabling that possibility of questioning my own privilege is still being, a, is still a conversation that I'm having. Right? So, you know, when we had this discussion about moving, I can tell you how Siddhama and Jokopas were not happy. They said, no, 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 Krishna, you are in center, you are sitting there. So I'm like, so then we had this chat on, you know, can we just turn it around in different ways? And then we did move it only with compromises of, uh, of, of them saying, no way, you're not moving there, you're moving here. But that changed, that even that changed the way I listened. So I think it really matters that the very physicality of an individual is a very important part of this conversation of where you are, how you see yourself. Uh, in, in performative, there's the audience. Are you the center stage of the audience? Are you moved away from it? Um, then are you, how much are you looking at the people around you? Are they responding to you? Are we responding to each other? All this, I think, participates in enabling that possibility of being the audience. I wouldn't say it always happens. No, I would not say it. But it enables this, 
that you can become an audience member, uh, you know, in the most uh, important fashion. Yeah, that's that's fascinating and, and so rare to see that kind of playing with space in these. Uh, yeah, in these I, I think we lose sometimes forget the, these very physical things actually make a dramatic difference. Absolutely. You know, I can I just give you the first time I remember the concert it was in Bangalore where I decided I decided and that is exactly what happened. So I am placing it that way. Um, I told my colleagues, um, you know, I don't want to sit in the center. One guy said, Yeah, sure. What do you want to do? So he said, I said, you know, can we sit like a jazz quartet, like a C, you know? Uh, and uh, so the violin and I are pretty much, we need to be closer because it's for, for musical reasons, we need to be close to each other. But can we just sit in the C? And I said, I can tell you, I was so uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable for the next 10 concerts because I'm used to raising my head and seeing everybody look at me, only me. I'm used to everybody else looking at me. And this changed the entire perception. And that changed the music I was creating. That changed the way I listened to people. You know, it's, it's quite transformative how even a simple thing like that, you know, like in a classroom, if you change the levels at which a professor and the students are seated, the listening changes. Absolutely, yeah. I find if I sit, you know, in the middle of the table as opposed to yeah. at the end, it changes everything. So I'll ask just one more question before I pass the reins to Aishwari, but um, to, to stay on the issue of sound, um, I wanted to, to invite you to talk about music and memory and history in relation to the Ashoka project, which is one of your uh, pandemic projects. And, um, and, and I'm, I'm just really moved by this project. And we heard a bit of it at the beginning of, of um, as people were coming to the event today, um, in which you sing the words of Ashoka, um, whose warcraft left him contrite, reflective, um, more oriented towards, sorting his, uh, uh, towards supporting his people. Um, and I was thinking about the fact that as a Carnatic musician, you're used to animating the words composed long ago, um, you know, and, but, but it, it seems so different, you know, like a composition by Dikshadar, you have a composition to work with, even though it's been sort of transformed by community memory and oral transmission, whereas with the edicts, um, these are usually read as history as, uh, you know, in we read them, but you've sounded them as song. Um, so what does music bring to our understanding that we can't get by just reading them? And, and they're such archaic texts. So how, how do you think of sound and music as sort of, um, you know, uh, placing these, these ancient texts um, in the here and now, how do you imagine the music in ways that bring out this um, social and political core um, of these texts? And just how do you construct something like that? Sort of how do you make sound yeah. for such a, 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 you know, for words that are literally written in stone, but yeah. not sounded? I mean, as far as we were concerned, edicts were the jobs of historians, uh, nobody else. Uh, and specialized historians to be even more specific. Um, you know, um, I knew nothing about the edicts for a long time. It was uh, my very dear friend, Gopal Krishna Gandhi, who actually one day just suggested to me that I should read them. He said, why don't you just go look at it? Because we were having, the, it was a discussion we were having on, on ethics and, and something like that. And he said, just go see it. Uh, and I began just looking at it. Now, the edicts have never come out of the stone. That's the truth. In fact, they've never been even uttered in sound, let alone, let alone tune. So you have them printed, translated in languages, and that's about it. So you've never heard it. And um, when the possibility first struck me, I'm, I had no clue what I was getting into. I'm, I'm a very instinctive person. And if I feel something is interesting, I'll just jump into it. I, I rarely reflect and wait. Uh, that's just personality. And I remember um, looking at it and it was entirely, the motivation to speak, very specific, was the politics of India today. 
without doubt, that was the trigger. Uh, that the, the political environment, the cultural environment today in India um, needed a looking at a looking at a certain past, um, which which triggers interesting conversations, interesting ethical questions, and hopefully bring about some discussion about our present. Right. Um, at the same time, I think not initially, but as I started going through the pro going through the process, I realized this cannot be a hagiographical project of showing an ideal of some individual or some time, but it also needs to be a, a complex project where we are bringing a complicated voice. Ashoka is a complex voice, but a voice that deals with the complexity and brings it out in social justice, in governance and in politics. So that was the political, uh, shall we say, energy that, that pushed me. But then there is like you asked, how do you bring that out of the stone? I had no idea. I didn't even know this is Prakrit. Some people call it Magadhi Prakrit. You could call it Ashokan Prakrit, Prakrit because there are multiple um, dialects to it. And Ashoka has ed had put edicts across his kingdom. So you have edicts even in Greek, by the way. So you have edicts right from Afghanistan or what is today Afghanistan, uh, right up to Orissa, right up to Karnataka, which is just a few hundred kilometers from where I am. Uh, so across this entire huge kingdom, he's sending messages to his praja, his people. Now, how do we utter that word? Uh, that is one step. When you, you spoke about Dikshita's composition. Now, I have a certain cultural history that teaches me, on, teaches me how, say, Sanskrit, or for a certain period of time at least, uh, transformed itself into musical sounds. I know how the syllable transforms. So if I read Sanskrit, I can sing it. I don't think. How, does, how should Prakrit be sung? What is the sonic transformation Prakrit undergoes? What happens to this uh, syllable? What happens to the vowel? I had no clue. I had, I, I had no clue to even access it. So actually I worked with uh, a linguistic scholar who actually read out the lyrics for me. We first chose a theme. The first set was on Dhamma, Dharma. And uh, we brought that theme together. And I worked with just the sound of uttering it for months. I didn't tune it. I didn't sing it. I was just uttering the words. And then I, some, I believe that by uttering it, I slowly just got a way to sing it. Now, no, I, is it the right way? Is it the perfect way? I don't know. Uh, I've tried to remain as close to the to the prose utteration, but the poetic utteration, which I'll call music, uh, has transformed a bit. I know it has, but it's part of the musical transformation. So, and the question you also asked on what, I mean, what do I choose to remember? It's an important question because it's a question of Ashoka too. Ashoka chooses to remember. So it's a, it's a fascinating personality. He doesn't in fact speak about his lineage in any of his edicts. He chooses to forget the past. Uh, he chooses to remember some parts of the past. He refers to them in a certain manner. He's creating a new future. He is creating a new world. So he too is playing with the idea of memory and remembrance. So I too am playing with that. I'm playing with remembering and I'm I am choosing to remember this complex person because we have forgotten him. We've forgotten many aspects. So this, there, there is politics in the choice of remembering. There is definitely politics there. And I remember that the day we actually put it out was the day Ambedkar embraced Buddhism. It was the day the edicts actually were brought out. And I, I remember this piece somebody wrote um, saying that it was in, in implying that it was inappropriate, that I was trying to bring together uh, two individuals who are not the same. And it was, I'm, I'm willing to have that argument, but the reasoning was quite interesting because by now in our fashioning of memory, Ashoka has been taken in to what is comfortable upper caste notions of Hinduism and now the new word Indic identities. That's the fashionable word today. So Indic identities. Whereas Ambedkar is seen as a person who's questioning the core of Hindu uh, belief system. Therefore, bringing these together was seen as a contradiction, not as two individuals who belong to different different times or different time spaces, different social contexts, but asking complicated questions based on life experiences, 
based on the need for change from extreme privilege and from no privilege at all. For me, it was fascinating to bring that, those two together and say, let's have this conversation from the past and the present uh, right now today. So um, I think um, it was even finding the sound or finding, trying to find the sound was also part of a choice, uh, a conscious choice, though I probably didn't identify it that way at that moment. That's fascinating. That just enriches the project so much more. Aishwari. Yeah, uh, and I, I just want to pick up from where you left uh, and, and try to bring two things that I'm, I'm fascinated by in, in how you spoke about sound and word. Um, my own sense is that much of the current strife, much of our contemporary moment or uh, the human condition at large is shaped around this war over words. Um, the, the, the current conflict in, in the world is, you know, colloquially we can say different things. We can say we have stopped listening to each other or one another, or we are talking past one another. There are many different ways of articulating that fundamental strife um, uh, around words, around what they mean, but also around what they sound. And what, what struck me was how much um, uh, thought you had given to articulating this distinction between dharma and dhamma. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, Ambedkar refuses uh, staunchly throughout his uh, prolific writing uh, career and trajectory, the word dharma for what he was doing. One of the current populists, and I use that word in the strong sense, well, I could say fascistic, but let's use populist. One of the current ways of under, populist understandings of Ambedkar is that uh, here is a man who dies in disappointment and realizes that the Indian state could not change the fundamentally oppressive structure of its own social and moral order and return to religion and dharma. Now, something is lost in that translation, obviously, because the religion he returns to is not the religion that the liberal exactly. Hindu or the conservative Hindu would want him to return to. And Ambedkar astutely holds that line because when he dies, he's obviously just finished in, in endure, I mean, in pain and sickness, the Buddha and his Dhamma. And he never lets go of that word. Now, if there are two different uh, and distinct questions that appear from this decision or what we might call, or, as TM was calling it, this very um, intrinsic moral judgment on his part to never part with Dhamma. Yes. Uh, so those who say that Ambedkar returns to religion after having disappointed himself with the idea of India do not actually use religion in the same sense he is using. Right? Yeah. Now, the question that struck me in, in, uh, as I was listening to the opening musical track, um, uh, which you sing uh, and render so beautifully, is whether as an artist um, who thinks and this is quite a rarity um, um, because we are so involved in, in thinking and performance that performance through thinking somewhere gets lost or at least vanishes. And so when you, when you render that, uh, e those edicts and when you use Dhamma and which you use beautifully, uh, is Dhamma for you that load bearing word that says something um, oppositional about the current Indian millennials. Is, is, are you thinking about something here that uh, for you consciously or otherwise, sounds like a transformative moment in how we understand art itself? Because I do believe that there is something very, very peculiar, Ambedkar would say something very singular about Indian oppression. Um, uh, Jisha used this word in her opening remarks. Jisha used this, this fantastic word, which is abolition. Right? If you look at the history of Black church and African-American militancy, music uh, in Black church, uh, and some forms of even other now classical um, idioms of music, you mentioned jazz. It is not uh, unironic, but it's also not a coincidence that the great... Uh, theorists of Western classical music initially thought jazz was not music at all. 
Oh, right? yeah. So there's that, right? So in, in some ways, music does an abolitionist work in some context. I'm fascinated by your, uh, the way you tease that moment and you say, no, actually I doubt it. And I want to want us to pause more on your doubt and, and, and articulate this kind of singular obdurate resistance some Indian musical traditions might have to breaching the border that causes this strife. So th those two questions are, uh, about Dhamma and the, and, and the singularity. I mean, um... It's uh, thank you for articulating this so beautifully. I mean, I mean, I don't even know whether it deserves an answer. I mean, whether there's an answer because you've you pretty much said it quite exquisitely. Thank you, Aishwari. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I think that's the intrinsic quality of 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 sound. First, we forget that um, we feel because of the sound and not because of the semantic many times. And the strife of uh, language or strife of word. Is also in the is is first in the sound of the word, um, in a in a very very simplistic manner. Um, I always found dhamma far more liberating than dharma. I'm just putting it very simplistically. Uh, yeah. It may not even make sense, but I'm just going to put it out there that somehow dhamma relieved me of something, but dharma bound me to something, and. So Ambedkar didn't go back to anything, actually. He was always in Dhamma. So this notion that he went back to religion or he chose a religion mm -hmm. is totally ridiculous. Uh, because if you read Ambedkar, it is Dhamma from the first word to the last word. It's nothing but Dhamma. And therefore, he just embraced it publicly. Okay, in, and, and, and he, he embraced it in a political act of embracing. That's it. So, but I think, I think that's the crux of the matter. So, you know, I, I had never sung Dhamma. Let me say that before that moment. I've never sung. I've, said, I've sung Dharma many, many times. The, the code has always been sung. But I've never uttered Dhamma. So it was also for me a new experience to actually sing Dhamma. Dhamma. You know, and... When you sang it, it didn't give you... There is also another thing. A word gives you a feeling in its utterance. We forget that too. It gives you a feeling in its utterance. And um, that's... So the feeling that, you, that I, I got when I rendered it in a certain manner is entirely different from what I got before. Maybe it is my cultural habituation that is giving that differentiation. That's... It's, pretty much possible but the reality of the experience is also there and what do I do with that reality is also very important uh, in this conversation so yes I think I was conscious of what it was doing to me I was conscious of what it was saying even for people who didn't understand and I think that it is the consciousness of this that is also very important important when we have an Ambedkar conversation that um, in not just the word dhamma, in every word that he used, actually, the consciousness that it is not just in what it did, if I may say physically, but what it implied in its resonance was always part of his, his discussion. And it's not just in written word. You know, if you just listen to the conversations at the Constitutional, Constitutional Assembly, you, can, you, you hear it every time uh, he got up and spoke. You would hear it every time. And I think that feeling is that feeling of dhamma, feeling of of ethic, of ethics, of fundamental ethics, and uh, that's the reason. Uh, that's the resonance. I think that I feel deeply to this project that there is this fundamental conversation with ethics that we are having in this project. And then your this is second question um, to the sonic challenge. Uh, or uh, protest or questioning that music has posed, if I got you right, right? Yeah. So, uh, but it's also interesting, uh, Ashwari, to see that this has usually been recognized only, recognized and it's very natural, happens only in, in social cultures that remain at the margins. The privileged never have this discussion. Why should I ever have this discussion about being protest? I have nothing to protest about. I'm the ideal, 
it's to the rest mm -hmm. to try and copy what I am, right? So if you look, so you, of course, within the way, okay, classical world, you've had uh, rumblings, you had these little movements, but I'm not going to consider them uh, earth shattering shifts. I'm not going to consider them. But if you look at whether the musical culture from the African American church music or jazz or hip hop, or in India, if you take uh, what is Ghana today or, or um, multilingual rap, um, and all these other art forms, Farai in, in where I come from, they're fundamentally entrenched in two emotional aspects. One, in declaring to the world and themselves of what is happening. Two, to tell the world and their, themselves that this should stop. And these are the two very political and philosophical ideas that are, res that are completely filling the sound that is produced. Which is, mm -hmm. why, uh, which is why you will find a similarity, for example, in rhythm. I, mean, this is a, I think rhythm is a very important aspect in this. We, we've not, we don't discuss rhythm and its role in emoting different things. If you look at the rhythmic formations coming from any of the societies in the world that are on the margins, you hear protests. They're not similar structures. I mean, they're technically not the same. They're not similar sounds. They're not similar instruments. No, but you hear the sound of questioning, if I can call it that rather than protest. And that is also a sonic palette. And um, so, yes, I think this, you see that, I mean, just look at, listen to African-American gospel music. It's rhythmical. And it's a celebration questioning because of that. And the whole body is part of it. The very being, the existence of the individuals in the community is part of that part of faith, part of questioning of society, part of saying faith is our question in a way, right? right. So I think, I think music has always played this role, but it's also true that those that participate in cultures that do not require to do this rarely engage with this very real politics of music. Because we always like to say we elevate you. You know, in fact, we let you escape the uh, the horrible things that are happening around us. You know, um, I just want to end with one thing. I just, in fact, I just finished an essay yesterday, and that's why this stays with me. Um, all of you have known about uh, the riots in New Delhi early 2020 uh, that uh, targeted a huge number of. Uh, Muslims in North, Northeast Delhi and then went out of hand. And I visited that space uh, a week or 10 days after, uh, after the riots. And I spent a day just walking around. And, you know, I was asking my question, asking a question to myself, why did I go? Why does a musician need to go there? You know, uh, why does a classical musician need to go there? I'm just supposed to sit and make music and uh, make sure that these horrible things don't happen because I'm the, um, I, I'm, I'm the person who can make you forget it all. But the truth of the matter is, that's what we need to do. Uh, we need to have physical experiences. Uh, we need to have physically move. So it's not just some abstract mumbo jumbo that we are operating in our head, but it's body. We forget the body because we have the privilege to forget the body. Just like a man doesn't have to, doesn't have to even think of his body. A woman has to always, a trans person even more, the privileged have to, have to move their body and feel all the pain that happens in the body. Yeah, it, it's, it's remarkable that one of the most, um, as you were speaking of the body, uh, one thinks of, obviously of touching um, and therefore not touching. And what is remarkable about Indian modes of violation and violence, what, what, what is remarkable about Indian cruelty, in fact, uh, as I like to call it, is, is that this cruelty can often be perpetrated not by touching, but precisely by refusing to touch. Exactly. And that, that obliqueness of our violence uh, points to something uh, uh, quite singular. And as a maker, often uh, you were talking about the Constituent Assembly, it's it's fascinating the other word that that intrigues him throughout when he reads the epic tradition mm -hmm. um, the ramayana and the mahabharata is maryada and and one thing uh, one thing that never actually uh, persuades him and he's and and never ceases to trouble him 
is how misogynistic the notion of maryada is. Uh, in fact, as a graduate student, when he writes in uh, his, his essay, Cast in India in 1916, as you know, he's still a graduate student at Columbia. Uh, he, makes, he makes this remarkable point uh, for someone who's in his early 20s that all obligation and therefore all notions of contract in India amount to just one thing, the, con the obligation of the woman to man, yeah. right? From 1916 to 1946, he, you know, he's struggling, like you were saying very, very powerfully, an enduring struggle to articulate, but also fight. That is all there is. The, the idea of Mariada is not the idea of discipline. It's not the idea of limit. It's the idea of a purist conception of violence which we need to f somehow undo. And it, it is in that sense that he mounts his, his most elaborate critique of the death penalty. The death penalty will not, it's not that the death penalty will target the Muslim in different ways. You can call it lynching, you can call it brutality, you can call it a trust, but it's actually in the end, capital punishment by other means. And he says, it's not that the death penalty will target only India's outnumbered, India's uh, vulnerable. It's that the death penalty construed within the tradition of Mariada will create new minorities. Mm. It will find new enemies. And that multiplicity or what we might call reproducibility is what caste does. And, uh, uh, and I think that is what to me uh, struck you about, uh, again, the initial notes is how powerful that was as I was listening to it. Uh, the idea that to, to reimagine democracy, to reimagine the relationship as Jisha would say between arts and justice is to reimagine the vocabulary and to right. rethink how mired we are in purist notions of politics itself. Um, is, I mean, as a- Can, can, I, just, can, I, just, can yeah. I just take yeah. something out of that? You know, you know we spoke of Maria, the notion of purity. Uh, you know, and, and the notion of purity governs our, um, our every inaction, if I can say that. Uh, and in this and, sense, yes. Yes. Uh, mm. You know, when I was uh, writing the book, Sebastian and Sons, uh, which fundamentally is, is about this notion of purity and purity. You have um, Dalit Christians who are basically making the murdangam, which is made of cow, buffalo, and goat skin. And you have Brahmins, 99.9% .9 Brahmins. Uh, playing this instrument as a, a presentation of purity, of the sound of uh, Nandi, of everything that's glorious about, about, about Indian past, about Hindu civilization. And I remember two things. Um, so as part of my field work, I had actually gone to the abattoir. We had chosen buffalo skin. I had skinned it. Uh, we had worked with the skin. We did all that. And I remember having these incredible conversations with the makers. And... I'll never forget two things that a maker told me. One maker said, um, Krishna, we are the people who make the Mridang. We are impure. We touch impure things. The Mridangam players play this pure instrument and they put it in their puja room and worship it. But we are the catalyst who can make the impure pure. Take us out and you will not touch it. I will never forget that statement. And it still gives me, uh, I mean, really, 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 really makes me feel, you know, just the, the, what he said to me. And then there is another thing, you spoke about vocabulary, it's a very important point. So until that, you know, what they do is you, you cure, cure the skin, you cut it into circles, okay? And till then it's called in Tamil, tol, which is skin, okay? The moment it is cut into circles and it's dried, and the hairs, hairs not, not always, but at least dried. It's called by the mrida, called by everybody, tatta, which means plate. It ceases being skin and it becomes a plate. In that transition is the impure becoming the pure. And everybody changed the vocabulary. Everybody changes the vocabulary in unison. Till the previous moment, they called it the toll is like this, the skin is like this, it needs to have this quality, the buffalo should be so old. They told me all these details. But after it dried, they said, look at this plate. And that's, and I just want to just say that that's, it's physically there happening every day. And I, you know, I remember, you know, seeing how the transition of 
the same material in word changes its entire environment and our relationship with it. Thank you, yeah. Um, Anna, uh, would you? Yeah. Um, should we open it or you can? Yeah, yeah, let's open it. This this has been great. And um, we would love to, yeah. to grill yeah. you <laughs> for hours. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think the audience deserves a word and uh, yeah, they have waiting. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe the first one we can ask here, I'll put this, um, let's see. Uh, so Nandini asks, is the experience of high classical music essentially an act of escapism, a continuous reassertion of power hierarchies that remain conscious and deliberate, not even fading temporarily? So let's, um, one of the, uh... Yes, it is. I can just give you a straight answer and say yes, but I'm, I, it's, it's far more complicated than that. So it's not just music, right? Our whole entire social construction is about escapism, it is about having the privilege to escape. And I'm talking about social cultural construct and not economic construct. And I want to say this again and again, uh, because then very often we, the privileged kind of umbrella that together. No, it's the social cultural, even aesthetic construct. Um, yes, it is escapism. Now, having said that, can I still deny the experience that is possible? No. So here you could look at something that seems like a contradiction. Um, at, well, you could listen to Khayal, you could listen to a great raga and actually experience something profound, but also see the ugliness of escapism. Now, I think that's, that's the realities that we should grapple with. And to say, to just slot it into one would be also a way by not engaging with this, with this duality. That somehow even the music escapes us at times, if I can put it that way. Even the music escapes our construction and gives us, offers us something. The, the question I will ask is when the music offers you something spectacular, what do you do with that offering? Do you just take it as being something that's momentary, that is only a reaffirmation of escapism? Or are you going to say that offering actually tells you don't escape? Now, that is our will. That is in our control. That is not accidental. I don't believe art is ever accident. It's a conscious, deliberate action. Listening as much as making art is deliberate action. So I think it is about what you want to do with the beautiful experience that art gives you and changes you momentarily. It's up to you to decide whether you want to come face to face with the ugliness that surrounds it or just say, no, that's up to us. Yeah, I can feel the second one. And uh, there are questions, remarkable questions around, um, around the relationship, I think, between freedom as, as we were talking and, and transcendence. But this, uh, this question, which, which, which touches on, on the other aspect, you have mentioned in the past, and uh, I'm reading here, you have mentioned in the past too about how the musical experience may not have much, if not anything, to do with the lyrics and words. How do you then place the role of word and meaning to the music you sing? I think it's a very important question. Um... I must say that I've also gone through some movement. Um, uh, I don't have to, I, I mean, um, somebody sent uh, a statement. I don't know who said this, something to the context of saying, um, you know, you don't have to always agree with what you did yesterday. You just have to be always moving. Uh, maybe that this comes from there. So I do believe very strongly that in certain art forms, in every art form, uh, word plays different roles. Saying a word is different from reciting a word. We know it. The experience is different. Um, the same line in prose listens. Dif we listen differently so in poetry. We listen. You could have the same word meaning the op having the opposite meaning in poems. How is that possible? You could ask, right? So somehow it is. It's also true that language and word change meaning in form, right? Similarly, there are certain art forms where I believe that the word actually is not about the semantic, but it's about the sonic. Rather, shall we say, greater emphasis on the sonic rather than the semantic. It's difficult for us to grasp fundamentally because we are, we are beings of understanding. And language is so, so inherent to the way we understand the world. We find it very difficult to dissociate right. meaning, uh, or rather mm. semantic meaning from it. 
Having said this, I write about this in, in a southern, southern music actually quite uh, in detail. I also realized in my discourse that it is impossible to hold that, that conversation and expect a leap from, shall we say, the literal to the abstract. You need to complicate the literal first if you want any movement to the possibility of the abstract. That is something I believe I disregarded a decade ago. Uh, uh, I, I, you, I held a very absolute position about the abstract. That's when I realized you have to play with meaning itself. You have to complicate meaning itself, mess it up, and allow other triggers then to come in. So I do believe meaning has a very important role in challenging meaning, if that even makes sense. Uh, you know? So you need to create multiple meanings. And if multiple meanings then can give you experiences of the profound, then you ask questions of the meaning itself. That's what you're trying to do as an artist. And that's when it's very important for me to say singing on, you know, you, because people ask me, you said, when you sing Rama, you don't care about Rama, it's Ra and Ma and sound. Why do you sing about man who is scavenging? You want me to understand the pain of the man who is scavenging. Because I want, if you feel the profound while uttering the word Rama a hundred times, and if you feel the profound in the sorrow of a man who is scavenger, you realize there is something very interesting going on here. And hopefully you will question the two. So that is where I have moved, I think, in, in my own journey of, of, of even understanding, um, using and enabling meaning itself to move us towards, shall we say, the sonic. Thank you. Um, I wish we had time for all of these questions, but maybe one or two more. Um, here's one from Mejgan Masumi, who's a Stanford graduate student. And she asks, um, thank you for sharing your music and your analysis with us, TM Krishna. My question is about who listens to your music and has access to it. Who is your intended listener audience? Are you surprised by the reception it uh, receives among diverse groups? Given your artist's commitment to break barriers of caste and class, are the sung lyrics and sound of your music accessible to the literate or non uh, to the illiterate or non-intellectual who may constitute part of your audience? Okay. Uh, when I began singing, my audience was uh, the core audience that would listen to Carnatic music, little extended, who would listen to Indian classical music. Um, things have changed over the past decade or more. Um, first, let's come from the literate or from uh, the privilege, and then I will, I will traverse the different audiences. I think it, uh, the interesting changes have been many people who have who are privileged, but who are not having any, any connection with Carnatic music or, or these traditions are listening to this music because of the politics of what I say and what I speak. Uh, there are people who have dissociated themselves from these kind of art forms who find it fascinating that, you, that there's somebody who could be in it and yet sing it and yet challenge it. So that's been an, an interesting audience. I've lost audiences too. There have been many people who have said, I've thrown all TM Krishna CDs into the dustbin. I don't listen to this man because he's anti-Hindian, he's anti-Hindu, he's, he's destroying Indian culture. So that also happens. And I think what has also happened is many, you know, when we sang the, when we, when we, when we did the Purambhoka Padal, which I spoke about, uh, people who have never listened to a raga heard a raga, uh, you know, because the word was accessible. You know, we make a mistake of thinking, or rather we don't make a mistake, we deliberately say that the classical art forms are inaccessible because they are complex. They are not inaccessible because they are complex. They are inaccessible because of the scaffolding around them. There's nothing in the sound that makes them inaccessible. It's the storytelling around them that then also makes you listen to it in a certain manner. If you make it so distant, if you make it so privileged, the sound is also privileged. So when you sing a raga, privilege is what people hear. And oppression is what they hear. They don't hear the raga. You strip it of it, there's at least a peek into it. Now, it doesn't mean, yes, so there are a lot of people in communities um, that are marginalized who, have, who we have sung, we've performed at, we've spoken to. We run small classes where Bharatanatyam is being taught along with Parai uh, in, the, in, in uh, five places in Chennai. So there are a lot of conversations happening. Now, does it mean that, it, that the people who didn't have access to this music have to love this music? No. They have shoved the right to say this is rubbish. 
isn't that an interesting way to look at it also, right? Uh, that the right to, dis to disregard it as even music, to say that this is not music. So I, you know, that is also an important part of the conversation. So yes, a lot of people who have never heard this music have got access to it, are listening to at least the songs that they feel connect them with it. Some of them have told me, I'm not talking about the literature, I've told me like, I like these two songs, but you know, those two songs that you're saying, I don't like that, it's, it doesn't work for me. So there is also choice that happens. There's also context. Uh, when I sing on the beach, who's listening to me? When I sing on the bus, who's listening to me? When I'm singing in the proscenium stage, who's listening to me? So there are multiple audiences. There are multiple people who are engaging with it. Let me just put it that way. I think that's a better word, engaging with it. For whatever reasons, they don't have to like it. My agenda is not for people to like the music. My agenda is people to engage with it and have their own experiences with it. That's all. And um, I think I also have strategy here. It's not just blindly doing it. I know what I want to tell the privilege <clears throat> when I sing this music. I, I, so, you know, any musician will tell you that the way they sing in different places changes because you know why you're singing. So it, that also affects the conversation as much as the receiving affects the conversation. Yeah, I, I, uh, just to, to build up on what you were saying, and that, that's a remarkable confluence between thinking and performance and, and all thinking is performative. Uh, at the end of the day, um, Savarna or Brahmin intellectuals think as if they were castless or they don't care for it, precisely because they have usurped that universalist position. Uh, while all Dalit critics of music will come with a name to it. So there's a whole Correct. politics of naming. Of, oh, absolutely. Of and, yeah, so, so uh, uh, and, and to build on Mejgan's question, I would perhaps end now with this uh, last question from our colleague at Stanford, uh, Professor Usha Ayer, who asks, while I always appreciate your strenuous self-reflexivity about your privilege, working further with the concept of doubt, it would be great to hear some more about the act of decentering upper caste privilege. I ask this as a dominant caste academic myself, even in professing and practicing anti-caste politics and pedagogy, how do we further decenter ourselves from these narratives of abolition and annihilation of our own privilege? You spoken about you have spoken about how this plays out in performance. Perhaps you could speak about your pedagogical practice in this regard. Yeah, uh, that's a fascinating question. I, I I don't even know if they have a good answer for it, but I will try. Uh, but before that, I would say one thing: this is, uh, to the previous question, there are also let's also not make the mistake. There are also people from marginalized communities who have tried to learn this art form. I mean, there is this presumption that right. they are they are not there. So I just want to just put that out there. The problem is there is no bridge for them. Uh, where do they go after learning the basics? Who will teach them? Will they have the courage to walk into a professional's home who is generally an upper caste person and say, will you teach me? Will their parents be able to pick up the phone and say, Mr. Krishna, my son or daughter sings very well? Will no. So that also not presume that there are people, that the people who are marginalized are not interested at all. They may be 0.2% interested, but that's a, that's, that's a hundred people, right? So let's also not make that presumption. That would also be a arrogance coming uh, subconsciously when you presume that there isn't. So I, I think the, the last question is, is, a, is a very important question. And I, I, all I will say is that I'm still grappling with that, is how do I decentralize myself from this discourse? When should I shut up, to put it very bluntly? Uh, you know, is something I am still learning. I don't know. Because I, I think we are somewhere programmed to take over. We are programmed to take over. And how does one deprogram that takeover? You know, so in the musical stage, I have found mechanisms. In, shall we say, public uh, debate and discourse, I'll tell you what, what things we have tried to do, uh, whether it is the activist work, cultural events that we have done. Uh, I think many times we have moved away from uh, consciously made sure that, that everything that is happening is not being uh, curated or not being designed by just two, three groups of us, two, three of us, which again, the takeover happens very naturally. Who is speaking about the, what, we, what is happening? Who all are speaking about all this? So all these are still work in progress in terms of action, in terms of action. How does, um, or a very simple thing, 
I mean, how many times is PM Krishna getting on stage uh, during, shall we say, a festival we conduct? It seems like a very, very ordinary thing, but it's a very important thing. So can he not be part of the conversation? Uh, how is that possible? But at the same time, there is that flip side that the camera is still turning towards you, right? So how does one move the camera away? There is also the problem is the person holding the camera is also coming from some privilege. So he can only see me. So how does, so, so this is a complicated uh, pattern that we are all following. So I think it is also the physical things that we do. The times that we do not talk, the times that we do not get on stage, times that we do not curate, times that we do not write. Now, how many times of times can I repeat this action consciously? Is something I am just trying. I am. Oh, I. I. I will. I'll be the first one to concede that I am also a person of ego and habit and privilege, and I am still trying. And I, I. I don't believe that I've done it right all the time. I probably am not doing it right all the time, but this is a challenge. So decentering yourself physically on the stage, decentering yourself physically in every other action that you do, for me is a very important first step. Just getting off the podium, you know, and as a metaphor. And I think we can do that. And I don't, I want, I don't even want to use the word enabling other voices. No, that itself is fundamentally flawed. You just are not there. Leave the space open. That's different from saying you're enabling. So is that even possible? I mean, I mean, how does one learn to do that? You know, otherwise you think that you're providing space. Who are, I mean, who are you to provide space? Who am I to provide space? So there is also that complexity. So whether it is in, in the activisty work that we do or in the writing, I refu I've refused to write in some, some publications very consciously saying, I, I cannot write on this subject matter because it's not my space. I will not write about it. Uh, so you need to make those decisions. You need to make those very conscious decisions say that, no, this is for me to listen. This is not a space I should be speaking. This is not a space I should be writing. This is not a space I should be singing. You know, yeah, um, all those things. Yeah. It's uh, the, the expression, as you were replying to this question, the expression that stands out for me is leaving space. And, and one of the things that Ambedkar does in the last decade of his life, uh, as he starts to read the Atlantic thinkers, the, the abolitionist thinkers of the American South, one of the things he says is we need to rethink not the body, but our emptiness. Yeah. That leaving yeah. of space, that void is where justice might begin. So uh, I thank you for that remarkable expression um, uh, to this question. All right, uh, Anna, some closing remarks or? Yeah, just um, just to thank you so much for these challenges and inspirations. And I think this is a, a, a really apt place to, to end the discussion. But thank you so much. Thanks, Aishwari, and, and thanks to- Oh, Nisha thank you both. I just, I, just, I, just want to, I, I just want to say one thing, is that you know people think that profound experience happens only uh, listening to music. No, it happens in conversations like this. So I want to thank you both um, for uh, allowing this space because I'm going to carry this for some time and uh, hopefully, oh, it will, no. hopefully it will imbue the tunes that I am part of in the near, near future. Thank you very much because it's, I think this is, this is where, you know, we always think big and big numbers and countries. I think it is in, in these little individual things that actually magic happens. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Our honor. Well, it's my unpleasant task now to wrap up this wonderful conversation. I wish we could keep going. Um, you know, I, I know our audiences have lots more questions and I know Anna and Aishwari, you've just really uh, offered very, very thought provoking questions and TM Krishna, we're not only grateful for your music, but for being such a fearless warrior in this struggle for justice for all of us. Thank you for insisting on the ways in which the body is marked, its corporeality, its politics, um, and for insisting on its presence even in our uh, music making. 
Um, I want to thank all of our panelists for very, very thought provoking reflections this evening. Um, and I also just want to remind our audience that we are going to keep our arts and justice series going uh, next week. In fact, we have another session on Wednesday, March 10th at 10 a.m. Sorry, at 9 a.m. Uh, that's California Pacific Standard Time, um, featuring Urvashi Butalia, Nai Mohammed, and Arthur Zia in conversation with Aziz Sohail. Um, and so hopefully we'll see some of you there. And again, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation, which I wish, you know, I didn't have to be the one to bring to an end, but no. thank you. So thank you very much. much. Thank, thank you, Anna. Thank audience. you, Aishwari. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.